Hey everyone, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. So in Chinese Mandarin, there's a phrase, Zhe Lao Hu, and this means paper tiger. And the idea behind this is something that looks very powerful, but under scrutiny, it falls apart. And I think that's a fitting analogy for the device that we're going to review today, which is the Supbor Q400. Now this device has been out for about a year now, and it initially retailed for $80, but now you can find it for $40. And there's a lot of things to like about this device, at least on paper. So in today's video, we're going to do a deep dive on this device and see all the things I like and don't like about it. So without any further delay, let's get started. Let's get started with some specs first. This runs an RK3128 1.3 GHz CPU, so a little bit slower than the RK3326 devices, but really not that much on paper. It has a Mali 400 GPU, but it only has 250 megabytes of RAM. And I think that's the first chink in the armor here. This is not enough RAM to really do anything on a device like this. Now, one of the things that attracted me to this device is the fact that it has a four inch IPS display. To me, five inches is just a little bit big when it comes to a handheld device and 3.5 inches is just a little bit small. So I kind of thought this would be like our Goldilocks and the three bears where this one is just right. It has an 800 by 480 resolution and a five by three aspect ratio. So that's basically a 16 by nine aspect ratio. So it is a widescreen device. It has a 2400 milliamp hour battery, which results in about four hours of playtime. Now, one thing to make note of here is it does not have a USB-C port, but a micro USB port. And that's not the end of the world, but in 2021 and even 2020, when this was first released, USB-C has become the standard for charging a lot of these handheld devices. So the emission of a USB-C charging port does stand out. And finally, the last big draw that I had for this device is that it has HDMI out at 1080p. It runs with a mini HDMI port, but down below at the bottom, it actually has four different USB ports at the bottom. And this is really attractive to me because on paper, this is the closest we have to a hybrid handheld and TV device. But before you click that buy it now button, let's go through the rest of the review and make sure you understand how all of these are implemented. Okay, so let's do some unboxing like I love to do. Not a lot going with this box here. It's very similar to like Pow Kitty devices where it's just very plain and black. The device comes in both blue and yellow. I'm really not a fan of either of the colors here, but I thought yellow would be the better fit. Inside you get an instruction manual, which literally is just the specs of the device. It actually doesn't have any advice on what to actually do with it. So the big reveal. And honestly, this is a very wide device. That was the first thing I noticed is that it's just like long, you know? And obviously the analog sticks up top are a little bit odd and we'll get into that when it comes to actual gameplay. But the D-pad I ended up really liking. It's a lot larger than the D-pads I'm used to using on these retro handheld devices. And not only that, it has a convex shape to it, so the edges stick out a little bit. And I really like that. It feels very comfortable. Now the analog stick sticks out quite a bit and it reminded me of one specific device in particular, and that's the Retroid Pocket 2. It seems like they have the exact same analog stick and they stick out that same amount. Now the D-pad on the Retroid Pocket 2 is 10 times worse, but in general, this Q400 D-pad is probably one of my favorite D-pads. The only thing I don't like about it is that the diagonals are a little bit hard to do because the D-pad is so large. On the right side, you can see the face buttons don't have ABXY, but instead they use the PlayStation symbols. But overall, they feel okay. They kind of skirt the line between clicky and mushy. And the bottom has start and select and volume buttons, and they're pretty clicky, but you know, it's not really that bad. You're not going to use those buttons very often anyway. On the bottom, you see the four USB ports for different controllers. And then up top, you see you have a mini HDMI port, headphone jack, micro USB charging port, your SD card slot, and then your on and off switch. Now let's talk about these shoulder buttons for a second. I'm not a fan of having these shoulder buttons flush in one line like this, like they are for many devices. Uh, but honestly, I really like the feel of these. They are a little bit clicky, but very responsive. They actually remind me of the shoulder buttons on the RGB 10, where they're nice and responsive and you don't have to push down too hard on them. So even though I'm not a fan of this layout, I think these are really well implemented, better than the RG351 devices. And one of my favorite features about these is when you push on the sides, it actually pushes down on the button. So you can situate your fingers however you want along those R1 and L1 buttons and they work just fine. The device comes with a generic 32 gig micro SD card. So I think if you're going to invest in this device, you're probably going to need to invest in a micro SD card. On the back, you see the Subbor logo and then two stereo speakers facing the back. And I'm also not a fan of rear facing speakers, but we'll see how it plays out when I cup it in my hands. 
Okay, let's do a size comparison here. You can see that the Q400 is about an inch wider than the RG351P, and that's a pretty significant size. But of course, if you look at something like the Odroid Go Super, that's another inch or even more wider than the Q400. So really, the Q400 kind of bridges that gap between the 351P and the Odroid Go Super. And it definitely dwarfs something like the RGB10, which is even smaller than the 351P. So my device actually arrived with the battery completely depleted, so I had to charge it first, but let's get into the firmware and see what this looks like. So this is the interface that we're working with here, and it's closed system, there's no way to actually adjust it. You can see that none of the arcade ROMs are actually showing the correct names, which is going to make it confusing for new users. And you have to tab over to the category section in order to find your different emulation systems. And confusingly, it actually doesn't move over left and right when you push left and right, you have to hit up and down to go left and right. So that takes a little bit of work to get used to, and I don't know why they did this. So it's already pre-installed with these specific systems, and it already has all these games already configured for it. So let's start up a game and see how it looks. So here we are with Super Mario World and the Super Nintendo. In terms of screen quality, I think it looks okay when you look at it straight on like this. But if you look at it at an angle, you can obviously see that there is a big gap between the glass and the LCD display here. And that results in a lot of glare, so you wouldn't be able to play this device outside, for example. The viewing angles also seem to be okay. Honestly, this is a fairly high quality LCD display. When you press start and select together, you get a very truncated RetroArch menu. So you can save your states, you can load your states, and you can adjust the controls, and that is it. One of the first things I noticed on the Super Nintendo is that the A and B buttons are incorrectly mapped. What should be the A button is actually the B button and vice versa. So you actually have to go into the controls and change that out. So you have to swap B for A and A for B. And unfortunately, even though it says you can save a core remap file, it actually doesn't save it across the system. So you have to go through and do this for every single game as you're playing it. So you start up a new Super Nintendo game, you have to switch the A and B buttons. But luckily, at least it saves for that particular game. So once you do this once for Super Mario World, you don't have to do it again. But that is definitely an annoying thing and an oversight by the creators. So when it comes to gameplay, it's fine. You know, I think it plays perfectly fine with Super Nintendo games here, but you can see that the screen is full screen and there's no way to change that. So you are going to be basically playing a 16 by 9 version of every Super Nintendo game. So if you are a purist when it comes to aspect ratio, you're not going to have a good time with this. But overall, the screen actually still looks very nice and clear and it has a pretty high resolution. That 800 by 480 display looks pretty nice. Overall, the display has fairly small bezels, which I appreciate. But you can see here as I'm playing Mario 3, the A and B buttons are switched again. So that's super annoying to me. So again, you have to go into the controls by pressing start and select, go in here and swap out B for A and A for B. And again, you have to do this for every single game as you start it up. So I assume that this company, they wanted to make a device that's very easy to turn on and play, but unfortunately these little oversights really take away from that. So in the spirit of Super Mario, let's try another Super Mario game. Let's do Mario 64. And I can't tell you how many frames per second are actually playing, because unfortunately that's not an option in the RetroArch menu, but you can see here Super Mario 64, one of the easier games to play on the Nintendo 64, does not play well on this device. F-Zero, I would say, is basically unplayable at this speed. Across the board, every Nintendo 64 game that I tested did not perform the way that I was hoping it would. None of these, I would say, are playable. Even Super Mario Kart, which is usually one of the easier ones to emulate, plays just terribly. And it might not be conveying to you as you're watching me play this, but if you were to actually play this yourself, it's like playing in mud. Everything is just super slow, and I don't find this enjoyable in any way. To give you a comparison, the RG350 does have a Nintendo 64 emulator, and it sucks. You know, there's hardly any games that are playable. And it makes sense because the RG350 has a much slower chipset than this one. But as you can see, the speed is about the same with Mario Kart 64 on the RG350 as it is with the Q400. To me, this is a dead giveaway that you can't play any Nintendo 64 games on this device. I don't even think it should be listed as one of the systems that are available for this device because there's not a single game you can play with it. Now, the only system that plays on the Q400 that actually has somewhat of a widescreen display is going to be your Game Boy Advance. And even though it's a little bit stretched out, it looks a lot better than your Nintendo or Super Nintendo games. 
But one thing I noticed when I started up a Game Boy Advance game is that the bezel itself, which is the glass pane that's over the LCD display, actually covers some of the display itself. So as you can see on the left here, some of that detail is actually cut off by the bezel. And this could have been easily fixed if they had used a piece of glass that didn't have this black bezel around it. So unfortunately, this is another misstep. It doesn't allow you to take advantage of the four inch screen that's on display here. Now, all that being said, Game Boy Advance games are actually a lot of fun to play on this device. That big D-pad is really, really helpful. For some reason, I've always been terrible in Mario Kart on the Game Boy Advance, but I'll tell you, I played my best round ever my first time playing it on this device because of that larger D-pad and the nice large screen. It was just a lot of fun to play. But if you move over to other handheld systems, for example, the Game Boy Color here, which natively has close to a one by one aspect ratio, it looks very squished on this widescreen display. And you can see here, the bezel is again, cutting off some of that screen. And honestly, it's not the end of the world. It's not like something on the edge of the screen is really gonna prevent you from playing a game, but at the same time, it's very apparent and it takes away from the experience. It's just a shame that such a nice D-pad is on a device that has so many other missteps. Okay, so booting up PS1 here, I definitely felt some obvious slowdowns as I was playing Tekken 3. And like I mentioned before, I don't have an ability to show you frames per second. You're just gonna have to take it from me that I definitely felt some slowdown as I was playing this game on the PS1. But to be fair, Tekken 3 has always been a hard game to emulate on the PS1 with low power devices. Other games such as Spyro here, they work just fine. And in general, arcade games seem to be okay as well, at least the ones that they had preloaded on here. So CPS2 games here, like X-Men Children of the Atom, they ran just fine. You're definitely gonna have to go in and remap the controls for certain games, but luckily you can save it for that game in particular, so you can just jump back into it later, which is nice. So next thing is I wanted to try out the HDMI function, and you can see here it looks great. This is a 1080p output. The menus look very nice, they're sharp and clear. Unfortunately, the menus themselves kind of suck to navigate, but at the same time, they at least look pretty. So outputting games here, you can see something like Game Boy is just very limited. You can't change any colorization options here, and it's going to be forced into widescreen display. Now, one thing I like to test anytime I'm using HDMI is what I call the tail test. And basically, I want to make sure that Mario's tail can kill any enemy as it's coming towards me. And as you can see here, it worked perfectly. So I'm sure there is some lag here with the HDMI connection, but it's not too bad. Like it's not something that's really preventing me from enjoying a game. In my experience, this has the best HDMI output that I've seen on any handheld device. And that includes the RG350M as well as the Retroid Pocket 2. In general, outputting games onto your TV looked very nice. And I think that because it's a 1080p output, a lot of games are gonna work really well on your TV. Sound works just fine, everything's good. The main negative for all of this is the fact that it's gonna be forced into widescreen. But again, if that's not a concern to you, if you're looking at this game and you're watching me get beat up as being Ken and it doesn't look bad to you, then maybe you're gonna enjoy that part of the experience. But if you are really particular about your aspect ratios, this is not gonna be a solution for you. Okay, we've been at it for a bit, well over 10 minutes, so let's go ahead and take a cat break here. Everyone say hi to Chicken, she's almost 13 years old. She's been having some thyroid issues, so, uh, you know, wish her luck. Okay, back to work. So one of the things I noticed on this device is it has this little tab here, and it looks like you're supposed to be able to pull a screen protector off. But as I was pulling it, I realized that all I'm doing is actually pulling up the glass display itself. You can see when I pull it, it goes right into the LCD display. So don't do what I did and pull it up like this. Just take off this tab because you're not going to be able to do anything else with it. So the tab itself is very sticky. So what I ended up using is just an alcohol wipe. One of the benefits of having relatives who are nurses is that we have just a ton of these at the house. Okay, so let's try out external controllers. So here's the controller from the PlayStation Classic. So as you can see, it's actually set up for five different users here. So you can set whatever gamepad they're going to be using. And I was hoping it would be a very simple plug and play experience where you plug in your USB controller and then you set what other gamepad you want and then you map the buttons. But in general, it didn't matter what I selected, it wouldn't pick up on my controller. So I wasn't able to map any of the buttons within the RetroArch menu. But paradoxically, when I actually started up a game and plugged into the controller, the D-pad would work fine, as well as a couple of the buttons, but not all of the buttons. So not only could I not get the buttons to map, but I couldn't actually play the game when I used a plug and play feature either. Now starting up a two player game, it seemed like the Sony controller controlled the first player and then the actual device controlled the second player. But again, I couldn't use the face buttons for the first player. So I decided to use a different tactic. I was gonna try my 8-bit DOE USB adapter here. And so then I connected it to my 8-bit DOE SN30 Pro. And it was the exact same experience. 
So I could control player one with the D-pad and a couple of the other buttons, but not all of the buttons. And then player two was controlled by the device itself. So it may be if you make some sort of delicate balance between the controls and the interface itself, you might be able to figure this out. I personally gave it about 20 minutes and I gave up. And I think that's what the typical user is going to do as well. They're going to try it one time around. They're going to try to mess with these settings as best as they can. And my expectation is they'll probably just give up. And sure, you could blame it on the user and say, well, they didn't try hard enough, right? But the software and the developer are the people who should really be making this experience work for the user themselves. That's the goal we're all trying to achieve. And this is where the Q400 fails. Okay, so we've been at this for a while. Let's talk about what I like about the device and what I don't like about the device. And as always, I like to start with what I like. First things first, I like this 4-inch display. I wish that there were more devices that had a 4-inch display like this because it's a nice size for me. The 3.5-inch size is pretty good with the 351P, no complaints there, but that last half inch actually makes quite a difference. And this has a fairly high resolution display, 800 by 480 Compared to something like the 351P, which is 480 by 320 this is a much better display. And of the few devices that I have tried that have HDMI out, this one is the best. It runs at 1080p and it outputs well, the sound works well, everything looks really nice on the display when you hook it up to a TV. So other things I appreciate about this device. I think it has a very nice D-pad. I like that it's large like that, I like that it's convex, it feels very natural in the hands. Like I mentioned, diagonals are not the easiest in the world, but I got used to that as well. This is one of my favorite D-pads on a device. I think that the face and shoulder buttons are adequate. I think they work really well. They're not the best I've ever played. And like I said, they're a mix between like mushy and clicky. I think they're a little bit more resistant than say an RG350's buttons, but in general, I can't complain. And overall, this device is actually comfortable to hold. Because it's a little bit larger, you can really cup your hands around the device. And it also allows you to redirect the sound from the back towards you by using your hands. Okay, so those are the things I like about the device. Let's talk about some of the things I don't like about it. Number one, there's no customizability for this device. Other than changing your button mapping, you can't do anything else. You can't display your frames per second. You're not going to be able to adjust the aspect ratio, anything else like that. And additionally, the default button mapping is incorrect. And so that's a pain in the butt to have to go through and change those for certain emulators. Now I've read that they tried to roll out a version of RetroArch for this device itself, and it ran into all sorts of bugs and problems. So unfortunately, there is no firmware solution for this device. And plugging in the SD card into my computer, unfortunately, everything's on the hardware. You're not actually able to change anything because it's all flashed onto the device itself. So we're kind of stuck with this crappy firmware. So some other things I don't like about this device. There's no safe shutdown mechanism. You basically just have to flip the switch off. There's no like shutdown button or anything else like that, which means that inevitably your SD card is going to get corrupted. This system is not meant for you just to turn it off with a flick of a switch like that. It's like yanking out the power cord from a computer. You're not supposed to do that all the time. It's going to mess up your SD card eventually. So this device just doesn't have the longevity it should. And 256 megabytes of RAM is just laughably small. And a lot of people speculate that's why RetroArch can't even play on this device is because it can't handle it. The amount of RAM is just too small. And like I mentioned before, the screen border on the display from that glass panel that's above the actual LCD panel, it's just really unfortunate that that border itself is keeping you from seeing the whole display. That is an easily prevented thing. And finally, the elephant in the room that I didn't even get to is the fact that the analog sticks above the D-pad and the buttons is just the weirdest thing in the world. If you're playing any game that uses analog sticks, this feels completely unnatural. And maybe lucky for you, the way you look at it, the only games that are really going to use analog sticks like this is going to be PS1 games. It's just a minor gripe, but I don't like that I have to use a micro USB port. It's just another cable that I have to have lying around when I'm so used to USB-C cables at this point. And finally, this really cool concept of having four external USB ports is just wasted. You know, the implementation of it really sucks. Now, at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters with a review like mine is the final decision of whether or not you should buy it. And this device, even though it debuted at $80, is now only $40. And that's a pretty compelling price, when you think about the 4-inch display and the HDMI out and the ability to have four USB external controllers. But unfortunately, the implementation just doesn't make it worth it. Now, I had read somewhere that this company actually went bankrupt. They're no longer in business. And I don't know if that's true, but at the end of the day, that's something to think about is that this device is not going to be in warehouses much longer. So if you're really interested in buying a device like this, or maybe you're a collector of just weird, obscure devices, $40 actually isn't that bad of a price if you want to have this, say, for example, as a collector's item, or to be able to show it off in 20 years as just a good idea gone bad. 
The honest truth is that when I asked for this device from Retro Mimi in order to review, I was hoping that it would be a hidden gem, that I would be able to open this thing up, get into the SD card, and make adjustments to it to make it worth that $40 price. And unfortunately, I hit a wall with this device. There are too many things standing in the way of making this a good device. I'm not able to get in and change the firmware at all. And in addition, the 256 megabytes of RAM really kind of make it impossible to work on anyway. So in the end, do I recommend this device? Even for $40? Unfortunately, no. But it is still kind of cool. Anyway, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and be sure to let me know if you have any questions in the comments below, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful for you. And we will see you next time. Happy gaming!